Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Matt Tutin, and I am the moderator for this joint webinar from two companies that work closely together on solutions that optimize software licensing in the data center, Intelligent Solutions and iQuate. The webinar will focus on optimizing data center license management, decreasing application costs, and reducing compliance risks. Before we start there are some logistical items that I need to cover. Lines are in listen-only mode. If you have any questions as we progress through the presentation, please use the panel at the bottom of your toolbar. We will have a short Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We will attempt to get, the, get these answered in the webinar session, but if we do not have time, then we will answer them by email to get your reg, uh, by your registration email address. The presentation can be made available in PDF format if you contact us at advice at intelligentsolutions.com. The contact details are repeated on the last slide of the presentation. This email address is also good for any further questions that you may have. As I mentioned previously today, we have two presenters from organizations that are thought leaders in software asset management. Brett Husselbaugh, CEO and founder of Intelligent Solutions, and Donnie Hamlet, Senior Managing Partner of iQuate. Brett and Donnie will expand on implementing a non-invasive multi-platform inventory capability in the data center, feeding relevant and reliable inventory data to an automated software license rules engine, and thereby achieving a license optimization in the data center. With that, I will, I will now hand over to uh, Brett to start the presentation. Go ahead, Brett. Thank you, Matt. As Matt suggested, today we're going to focus on four topics. First, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenge, the complex licensing challenge. We'll talk then about our company's uh, Intelligent Solutions, also ESI, our answer, which is the complex license analyzer. We'll talk a little bit about that and how it works. Then we'll talk about what we've seen in using it for the last year and a half, some of the gaps we're seeing in some of the popular auto discovery tools which led us to iQuate. And I'm going to turn it over to Donnie at that point. Donnie's going to talk about iQuate and how they do data center specific discovery and inventory. And then Donnie will turn it back over to me and I'll wrap it up and we'll go over how all this would fit together and the way we recommend going about solving this challenge. So let's first talk about the challenge. I can't tell you how many times uh, I'll talk to somebody and they'll say to me, well, we're just going to find out all of our installed software using our auto discovery tool. And as the sign that we've chosen for this particular slide suggests, it's a little more complicated than that. Hold on to that uh, thought. Uh, some of the examples that we see some of the main struggles with in trying to understand licensing in the data center. SQL Server is a challenge uh, in Microsoft. Not that they're the only Microsoft challenge, but uh, that's one of particular interest. Uh, you've got uh, server cal licensing you can do, or you can buy processor and now buy core. And there are a lot of variables that you have to understand. Just understand how many licenses you need to own in order to cover the way you've chosen to deploy SQL Server. And Oracle's not much different. That's also a challenge that we see people struggling with. <laughs> Oracle has a core factors table if you're licensed by processor that you have to uh, look up and understand and apply to the number of cores uh, in the machine that's um, got, uh, got the application on it. Also, uh, Oracle has a tendency to, or you choose to, install a lot of different add-on applications when you install the database product, for instance. Every one of those has to be licensed, and uh, that's not always understood. So there's quite a bit of analysis work that's done to understand what licensing needs are for when Oracle's been deployed as well. And one we find a lot of interest in, which is IBM and their processor value unit, PVUs. A lot of their titles are, the metric is a PVU. And the PVU is also a lookup into an IBM table to understand how many PVUs. It's based on processor, sometimes the manufacturer of the machine, and uh, other parameters. Uh, but that's just the start of it. That's, then you have to understand uh, virtualization. Uh, high watermarks, and a few other things before you understand exactly what the licensing needs are for any of these IBM titles that are licensed by PVU. And when you get right down to it, there's a lot of information that you need to take 
and analyze and come out with the, the right number of licenses based on how the software has been deployed in your environment. And some of that information would, uh, would and should come from auto discovery, uh, understanding how, it's, how these machines have been virtualized. That's an important factor, specifically the parent-child relationship, cores both at the virtual level as well as the physical level, uh, processors at the physical level, uh, also out of asset management, what environment has this machine been deployed to? Is it a production box? Is it a test box? Is it in disaster recovery? And a few other things such as the processor manufacturer come into play, the model of the server that the processor is in. So with you, you collect these variables and then you've got to go usually step by step through some fairly complicated rules that had a lot of if then else uh, type logic in them and apply those rules based on the information that you know about uh, the way it's been deployed. And out the other end of that analysis work should come, okay, you're going to need this many licenses, again, based on how you've chosen to deploy the software in your environment. Now we see clients, and we have seen clients, struggling with that piece. The auto discovery gets them so far, kind of gives them a raw input to the information, but then they've got to go to work using spreadsheets and other manual means um, in order to come up with how many licenses are required. And uh, for some titles, it's a daunting task. It's akin to a thesis project you know, requiring hundreds of hours. You know, for instance, SQL Server might take hundreds of hours just to understand, depending on how large your deployment is, uh, how many licenses you're going to need in order to cover that the way you've chosen to deploy it. So that gets us back to that comment that we hear a lot, which is, well, we're just going to have auto discovery. Go find all of our install software. And that's just it. It'll find that the software is there but it won't tell you how many licenses you need to cover that install and the way you've chosen to install it. That piece requires analysis. It also requires the licensing guides of the particular title that you're working with in order to perform that analysis. And as I mentioned, depending on the title, that could take you know, quite a bit of uh, time in order to, to do. And, and a lot of times we see frustration too. Uh, people frustrated trying to uh, you know, apply those complex rules so that was what we saw, and this is how we uh, answered that challenge. We call it our complex license analyzer. And it basically takes the raw information coming from auto discovery, and it uh, is a rules-based engine where you set up the rules and applies the rules. And the rules are the licensing guide rules, you know, as they were written by the publisher. Now we chose, uh, our general philosophy, you don't know about eTelligent, we have uh, a SaaS platform that is a full end-to-end -end software and hardware asset management platform. And uh, I personally have been in the business for 25 years, and so this is a, a culmination of 25 years worth of experience of doing asset management in this platform. And uh, we have uh, uh, one piece of it that we added was this complex license analyzer to deal with these complicated licenses that we find in the data center. And our philosophy has always been uh, to create a solution that's as general as possible so that we can put the power in the hands of the users in order to be able to be in control of their own destiny so that they're not waiting on us to come out with the next release or um, you know, respond to, to development or customization requests. So you know, for instance, same with our workflow engine, you can design your own workflows with our graphical tool. Uh, this designer was built along the same lines, so you've had this rules designer, which is graphical in nature, it looks like Visio. You can design your own rules, or you can use some of the rules that we've designed. So this is a, a, a different than some of the approaches that we see where it's a module. You want to do PVUs, well you need the PVU module, you buy the PVU module, and now you can do PVUs. Uh, in our case, it's a, it's a much more general solution. Here's a rules designer, design your own rules uh, for those rules that you feel comfortable doing that, or you can use our rules that we've designed. Uh, or you can take a copy of our rule as a starting point and modify it in case you've got special considerations that you've been able to ne negotiate into your licensing that you want to capture in your rule. The bottom line was the uh, analyzer was designed to save those hundreds of hours of manual or semi-manual analysis work that has to be done in order to arrive at how many licenses you need. So if you just take an example of this visually, what, what it really works at, this is a, an example using SQL Server. And uh, I might mention too, by the way, in this case, uh, if you're using a file-based or an added remove programs-based way of discovering software installations, that's not really the best way to discover SQL Server. You want to discover SQL Server uh, 
as something that discovers running instances of SQL Server, not try to identify it based on files that it finds. You'll get very inaccurate counts if you um, if you use a file-based or add, remove programs-based discovery tool. So even when you get into the data center, there may be you know various flavors of discovery uh, needed to be successful, or a data center-specific type tool, as we're going to discuss later. But what happens is we get that information from discovery. It tells us that the software is there. We set up a tracking record to track that deployment. We call it an authorization. We default that tracking record to requiring one unit of license. And then the analyzer picks up that tracking record and runs it through the rule. And after it goes through the rule, it'll update how many licenses are required to license that particular instance that was found. In some cases, it'll be more than one. In some cases, it might be zero because it could be an instance that was found on a machine that was already licensed. And so if the machine's fully licensed, you don't need to license this instance. So the, um, the analyzer is able to, depending on how the rule's been designed, I mean, the, the sky's the limit basically on designing these rules, designing, uh, depending on how the rule has been designed, it'll come up with you know, the right number of licenses needed based on how you have chosen to deploy, deploy the software. And it's depth of analysis. It goes quite deep, actually. All these different parameters that are referenced in these licensing guides you know, takes into account or can take into account depending on how you choose to design the rule. Uh, you know, the uh, virtualization, uh, the rules around virtualization. Some SQL Server have, have limitations on how many times you can virtualize based on the addition that you put there. The rules are capable of testing those uh, uh, restrictions. Processors, cores, the environment that you've installed it in, that's usually coming to a set of uh, asset management. It's, it's not often that there's not really something you can auto discover about a machine that tells you whether it's a developed machine or a production machine. That has to be added in by some sort of process work that's, uh, that would be considered asset management. Uh, we use the rules engine for bundling. Sometimes a particular uh, license is included in a bundle, and uh, we can have the rules engine understand that it found it as part of a bundle and then zero out any license units required for the particular bundled piece of software. And then in SQL Server 2012, for instance, uh, virtualization restrictions uh, are uh, covered by software assurance. You know, if you don't have software assurance on that particular machine, you can't virtualize it. If you do, you can. So we are able to test whether or not the analyzer is able to test whether or not there's active software assurance. Again, that requires uh, software asset management practice, uh, but we do have the ability to do that. In the, uh, in the design of this analyzer, you know, we've known from experience that auto discovery is usually not 100%, and uh, so we made it tolerant of missing data, uh, so that in the event that there is data that's not presented to it, uh, it has the ability to still come out with an answer, albeit a more conservative answer. And so, uh, you know, again, knowing that auto discovery is not 100%, there had to be um, at least some answer attempted. In our rules, we designed that answer to be conservative, as I mentioned. And this is an example of what one of those rules looks like. This is a screenshot from our um, the design tool, the graphical design tool. You can see it does look like Visio. It acts like Visio. You drag one of these process steps, these decision points, onto the work area, and then you just wire them together. And then you have a list of, right now today, it's 47 different functions that you can execute at any one of those process steps that do things such as, and you can see the first one is looking up the PVUs out of the IBM PVU table, and then things such as checking is it virtualized, how many processors, calculating the number of cores based on processors time cores, all that stuff you can do in, you know, when you lay out your rule. So the bottom line is, that depending on how you lay your rule out, it, it will come out with the right number of licenses required. Uh, so let's talk about some of the challenges we've seen. So this has been out in the world for a year and a half now, and we've got several clients using this. And uh, you know, we'll talk about some of the challenges. First, first, before I do that, let's talk about the data center environment versus desktop. This may be self-evident, uh, but the bottom line is an asset, a server that is in the data center usually costs more money than a desktop, uh, quite a bit more money. And this is uh, sourced by Gartner. So even though there might be fewer of those things in a data center than there are desktops out in the world, uh, there's still quite a mon bit of money tied up in those assets in the data center. And then specifically in the software that's running on those assets, data center software is more expensive. And if you look at the typical spend of, a, um, of an IT shop, uh, about two-thirds of that is uh, of the software of an IT shop. About two-thirds of that software spend is data center server type software versus one-third would be uh, desktop. 
So most of your money, software money, is tied up in the data center. And so uh, with that in consideration, you know, you know, that should kind of guide you as to what your expectations should be as to, you know, it's a, a more complicated problem. And you've got uh, you know, more t money tied up there. Everything costs more in the data center. Well, so should be the, you know, your expectation should be the solution does too uh, to solve this. Uh, the question becomes, you know, what's the, what's the cost of really not knowing how we're deployed? What's what's our audit risk? What's our loss of opportunity because we've got software sitting around that's idle that we're not aware of and we're not putting it to proper use? What's our loss of opportunity because the way the deployments have kind of happened over time have yielded a very inefficient way of deploying it based on how things are licensed? We could consolidate a little bit. We might be able to change. Uh, move this under a different edition and, and save ourselves a bunch of money uh, doing that. Uh, those things don't become obvious to you unless you have the underlying information to, to do that analysis work. And so the, it's kind of a double whammy in the data center. The, uh, the software, the stakes are higher, the money available is more, but the problem is more complicated. It's, so it's not a slam dunk solution. You need some specialized uh, capability to really tackle this in, in, a, in a way that, that is is uh, able to be done given the resources that you can bring to bear on this and the technology and the tools available to you. All right, so with that in mind, let's talk about real world. Some of the stuff we've seen uh, in the last year and a half using the analyzer. Now the analyzer does spit out an answer, so we're happy about that. It is spitting out the answer, and when it gets the right information, it spits out the right answer. So at least it seems to work the way we design it to work. Uh, the challenges we've seen is getting at the information that it needs, and so typically when we're in an environment, we're in an environment where a client already has auto discovery. And usually what we find are these names that you see here. These are the auto discoveries that we see most. So we see SCCM, Altiris, Marimba, Landes, but mostly SCCM, Altiris is what we see. And so the client says, well, we already have auto discovery and our platform's fine. We can take auto discovery from anywhere. As a matter of fact, we'll often take multiple auto discovery feeds if you have multiple auto discovery systems in place. The more, the better. But uh, largely, these are the types of systems we're seeing. So as we take auto discovery and we move into the data center and start to apply the analyzer to come up with uh, licensing needs for the data center, uh, we have found some, some uh, issues with this. Uh, I would say that if you look at these names, you might agree that uh, many of these were really originally designed to help solve managing the desktop. That is a, a fairly significant challenge, and that's the ultimate or the primary focus. Uh, but they also work in the data center. But what we're seeing, though, is we're seeing sometimes, for instance, some of the Wintel boxes. Uh, most of these tools use um, uh, WMI queries in Wintel, and they'll return to us the process, the core count is the processor count. Well, that has a significant impact on by processor type licensing, or they, we won't get it at all. We'll get you know blank processor information. Now, as I mentioned, our rules will take, will will we'll tolerate that, but we'll come out with a number that's you know, as it turns out, is uh, significant, it's material. So we, we might be seeing this happening in only 10% of the overall population, but that 10%, uh, when you multiply it by the number of licenses uh, that we're saying you need based on our estimate, uh, that's a material number uh, because of the cost of the licenses in the data center. And so, um, uh, you know, the bottom line is 10% missing data, 10% inaccuracy is, is turned out to be um, uh, not good enough. You, you need something that's a little bit better than that, a lot better than that actually in the data center. So we are uh, also seeing uh, challenges in understanding parent-child relationships, uh, physical to virtual. Uh, it could be you know bare metal or non-bare metal, it doesn't matter, we're not seeing it. You know, we're not being presented the physical to virtual relationships and these licenses, these complicated licenses, a lot of them have restrictions on uh, virtualization, or if you're doing subcapacity, you need to understand that relationship. And uh, you know, it's, again, our analyzer will come out with an answer, but it's not going to be the one that you'd want to pay for. Uh, missing hypervisor. If we're doing uh, Oracle, and we want to again look at subcapacity, you know, you got to be hard partitioned for Oracle, and it's got to be a hypervisor that they recognize as hard partitioned. Um, and so we're missing that information. Again, we're we're not able to really you know come out with the proper number of the value. Uh, we're seeing entire server groups missing. That's more of a political issue that I'll talk about in a second, but you know that is a consideration. And uh, we do get many of our clients don't even have a Unix discovery tool, uh, so we're, we got nothing coming to us from Unix. That's a spreadsheet that has to be manually input uh, to us or fed into us. Um, but those that do have Unix, we're seeing it's not nearly as robust as Wintel. 
I mean, this is very, really fundamental, basic information coming to us, not nearly what we need. So that's what we've been challenged with. You know, it's the, the engine, the analyzer works. We need to feed it better information base or more complete information so that it uh, can do its job the way it's designed to. The next challenge that we're seeing, it's worth mentioning, it's not really going to be solved by uh, tools or anything technical, but it is political. Uh, when you look at the desktop, you know, you've got kind of the infrastructure team responsible for the desktop. They're usually pretty solid at being able to control some of the core pieces of the image that goes on that desktop, such as the virus scanner that goes on it. And if any agents are going to be deployed for auto discovery, they're pretty good about getting it out there. So what we see in the environment is fairly decent coverage uh, by auto discovery for the desktop. Different story in the server world. You know, these servers aren't owned by one group. They're owned by a, a bunch of different groups. You know, the, a group of servers you know, together form the basis or the foundation for an application. That's really how it's being managed is the, at the application level. And so there are different groups that manage these different applications, and they have, you know, political clout. And all they got to do is say, that's disruptive to um, performance on our servers, and there goes auto discovery. You know, or they'll disable uh, an agent when it comes on there. So that, that's a challenge that remains to be solved, but, uh, but for sure we're seeing that. We're seeing entire server groups uh, not being presented to us in auto discovery uh, because of these political challenges. In our system, okay, we can tolerate all of that, but it means some manual work. Someone's got to go do some remediation, find out the processor values that are missing, and feed that into our system usually through a spreadsheet that gets fed in, completes the data, and then the analyzer will spit out the right numbers. But if you're trying to automate this, if you've got limited resources to be running around trying to you know, isolate or figure out how many processors are on this particular server, uh, then you know, really this is falling short of that goal. Uh, and what we're seeing the, using the, the current existing auto discovery tool. I'm not going to go through all these slides. As Matt mentioned earlier, we will offer this presentation to whoever asked for it. If you send in a request that advice at intelligencesolutions.com, we'll send you over a PDF copy of this. So I won't go through every one of these particular slides, but this just gives you an information of some of the information that we need, this particular case for SQL Server. Uh, also not mentioned here is if this box is in a cluster. And what is its role in the cluster? That's also information that we need to understand the licensing impacts. Uh, that can also come from auto discovery and sometimes from asset management. Uh, same by Oracle, same by PVU. Uh, like I said, I'll skip that. But because of this challenge, okay, so we built a tool that seems to work based on our experience so far. Uh, that will save hundreds of hours of all that analysis work that you have to do to apply the licensing guides, the information that you've collected about how you've installed software and the hardware that you've installed it on. Uh, what we're finding, though, is the information collection needs to be stepped up quite a bit if you're going to do this automatically. And that led us on a hunt for a tool that can do that, and that's what led us to iQuate. So iQuate was designed specifically for the data center, and so they're, uh, they understand uh, virtualization on both um, bare metal and, and non-bare metal type uh, platforms. They can, they can give us that, um, that uh, relationship between the parent child and the clustering and, and, uh, as, as well as the, the cross-platform, Wintel versus Unix. So I'm going to let Donnie speak a little bit more and get a little more depth into exactly how they do that, but that's, um, uh, that was what we had to go looking for to, to fill in that one gap that was remaining. So, Donnie, I'm going to turn it over to you, and you just let me know when you want things advanced. Thank you so much, Brett. I appreciate it. Uh, once again, my name is Donnie Hamlin, and I'm from iQuate, and we'll be walking you through our solution today. So, Brett, if you could advance the slide for me, I'd really appreciate that. So, just let's talk a bit more about comparing the desktop to the data center. As you know, those are, first of all, two different teams. They're two different platforms, and they have very different requirements. If a desktop goes down, then you know, it's not that big of a hit to the productivity of a company or an organization. However, if a server is to go down, it could cost the company tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars in losses. So in the data center, they have a lot of different things that they're very sensitive about. Um, and let's go through how the iQuate solution, which is IQ Sonar, addresses some of these sensitivities. As Brett talked about earlier, we're a purpose-built tool for the data center. And we've taken all these things into consideration. Unlike a lot of the other tools that are out there that are desktop-centric and they try to move over to the data center, 
we are data center focused from the start. And it gives us the capability to also uh, extend what we do to the desktop. So let's go through a few of the things that makes us different. First off, we're agentless. Now this is significant as Brett talked about earlier because many, many people within the data center or operators in the data center refuse to put um, scanning agents on the servers for fear that it's going to cause a denial of service or it will negatively impact performance. Um, another thing that has to do with the fact that, and we don't do that, we do not need an agent to scan the environment. Another benefit of the fact that we're agentless is due to the fact that with agents, sometimes they don't get deployed, and even when they are deployed, sometimes there are health issues with the agents. So in many cases, when you have agents in an environment, you may get at best maybe 95%, 90% of the environment, but you have a, you know, a small but significant, uh, significant amount of the environment that may not be covered. So what we do is we do discovery by IP scan, and what we're able to do is we're able to fill in all the gaps that the agent based technology may have missed to give a comprehensive view of that data center. Now let me move to the next point, which is that we're non-invasive. We only, we only read the data on the servers. We do not make any changes to the server. We do not make any, uh, add any software, remove any software. We only read only. And that's part of our mantra, which is the do no harm. The next piece is that we're low impact. So because the way our software is written, we understand that those servers have to be available and they have to respond to requests that come from clients that could be processing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars in transactions. So the way our system has been created is we're very sensitive to the load that's on that current server and we will not negatively impact performance of the system. And then the last part, when we look at data centers, Again, a lot of the tools that are out there are desktop specific and they're focused on Windows and that's great. But within a data center, a lot of our very high priced software isn't on Windows servers. It's on Unix and Linux servers. And what we have the capability to do is to look not only at the Windows systems in depth to gather licensing information that's necessary for accurate management, but we're also able to gather information from Unix and Linux systems as well. Now, you can see from the slide that we are a secure solution. We use the native security protocols that are embedded in the different applications, so we're not adding anything to a security uh, perspective to their environment. They're using things that they're familiar with already. For example, like Secure Shell, uh, when you talk about Unix Linux, or Kerberos, like with Windows. And when we do go out and we scan, you can see from the slide that we look at a bunch of different layers. We look at the hardware layer, the virtualization layer, the operating system layer, the clustering layer, and the enterprise applications. So again, all those titles that are rich and expensive in the data center, we're able to pull back a full view of them. And we'll talk about view in a few more minutes, a few more seconds. Could you advance the slide, please? So, when we talk about SAM for the data center, it's about mitigating risk. And in order for us to mitigate the risk, we really have to have a complete picture of what lives in the data center. And the analogy that we use within iQuate is a deck of cards. With a deck of cards, you know, you take time to get all the cards lined up, but if you make one false move, you could knock down that deck of cards and you could waste all your time and effort. And it's very similar when we're talking about SAM as it relates to the data center. Could you move forward, please? So what you're seeing in this triangle is all the different layers that we need to gather in order to understand what the deployment cost is within an environment. So when we name deployment cost, we're saying, what does it cost uh, for you to license this software in the environment? Again, you know from a data center perspective in these very expensive enterprise titles, if you're not gathering all the information, you can be out of compliance. And out of compliance could pose millions of dollars of risk or hundreds of thousands of dollars of risk to your organization. But if you're purchasing too much for the software because you don't have visibility, then you're wasting valuable dollars that could be dedicated to other IT projects. Now what's important, that the, what's important about each one of these layers? I'll touch upon it briefly. So for the physical layer, we need to get core information and processor information. When we talk about IBM, as Brett talked about early in the conversation, or Oracle, or Microsoft SQL Server, core and processor information is very, very important. Um, 
one of the things that we're able to do is we're able to do corrections on core information. So through tables that we have within IQ Sonar, if we find out that something is incorrect, we can actually correct it. And in fact, we notified Microsoft that WMI will actually report uh, incorrect core data. And that's absolutely critical to license SQL Server. When we move up the stack to the virtual layer, we're able to see what the VM hosts are, and we're able to see what the VM guests are, and we're able to map them back and forth between one another. And that's critical. So when it comes to virtualization layers, we're able to look at other virtualization technologies. We're able to look at virtualization as it relates to LPARs, as it relates to Hyper-V, and as it relates to VMware. The next thing is going to influencing the licensing of enterprise applications, for example, the Oracle database, SQL database, et cetera, is clustering. There are different licensing metrics associated with whether the software is clustered or not, and we also gather that information. Next phase is installed software as to what's on the, so what's on the server, what software is there on that server. In some cases, you may find that two software titles live on the same server, and that may be inefficient from a licensing perspective because you end up double paying. And then as we go up the stack, the last most important piece is software configuration. Now, to exemplify this would be Oracle. Oracle has something which are called options. And when Oracle is installed, many of these options may be activated or turned on. What IQ Sonar has the capability to do is to reach and dig deeply in what we call measurement within Oracle to determine an option that's installed versus an option that's in use. And that's relevant because when you get ready to do licensing negotiating, you only need to pay for the options that are in use, that you are using from your application perspective. With all these layers, we can arrive at the correct deployment cost and position for the environment. However, if you move the slide forward, if one of these layers is missing, it's just like a stack of cards, and we lose the ability to correctly arrive at that cost. So again, I want to emphasize, you, we provide the complete picture, and you need that complete picture to license your environment accurately. Can we move forward, Brett? So let's talk a little bit about our methodology that we use. We have a methodology that's called DIME, and DIME stands for Discovery, uh, inventory, measurement, and extensibility. And to kind of help you with this analogy and what it means and how it's relevant, what you're looking at with the picture that's in gray above discovery is a picture uh, that was taken from a telescope when viewing Mars. So you can think when the first scientists were looking at Mars, they discovered a face on Mars, or what appeared to be a face. From a, uh, a perspective of technology and how it is an analog to IQ sonar, we would, in fact, do a discovery in the environment, and we would realize that there were two servers that's there. Just for us doing a, a TCP scan of the environment. Can we move to the next slide, right? Or the next? Uh, thank you. Now, the next phase, and let's look at it back to our uh, Mars example here, is inventory. So after you know something's out there, you, you have to get more data for it. So what we do is we have security credentials entered into IQ Sonar, and we will connect to that system. Very similar to what they did with Mars, where they sent out an explorer to actually get a closer look at Mars. And when that explorer was actually beaming down and looking on that face, it wasn't a face at all. It was actually a mound, right? But that didn't give them the complete picture. If we make an analog to what IQ Sonar does, we can see once we do inventory that the two servers, in fact, have Oracle installed on them. And those two servers are not physical servers. They are VM. That VM, those two VMs live on one physical server that has 20 Oracle processor licenses versus the, uh, the two single servers that have a single Oracle processor license. Can we, go to, can we advance the slide forward, Brett? Now, the next phase that we need is we need what's called measurement. So after scientists realized that this is what the face of Mars looked like, and in fact it wasn't a face, it was a mound, they said, you know, we really need to understand what makes up that mound. So they sent down a uh, lander to the surface of Mars to actually take soil samples and to actually look around Mars and see what was there to gather in-depth information. And that's what we do at the measurement layer as it relates to IQ sonar. So when we look at the example that we've been speaking to so far, we can see that not only do we gather information about the VM, we gather information about the VM host, but we can see from deep measurement that we do that there are other, that this is a uh, this is this VM 
uh, I should say this VM host is part of the VM cluster. And if you're familiar with how licensing works, this changes the picture greatly because you have to license for a cluster differently than you have to license for a single server, at least when it relates to Oracle VMs. Can we advance the slide, please? And then the last piece is extensibility. So again, once we began the measurement process, we want to be able to do other things with that data. For example, once they had that lander there, they could collect lots of other information that they were able to forward back to analysis. And similarly, we do the same thing. We take the rich data and accurate data that we gather for our license requirements, and we're able to push that upstream to intelligent solution, for, which is the complex license analyzer. So that's what we mean by extensibility. Can we move forward, please, Brett? So let's talk about the impact and the value of data and why it's significant. So let's say that we were running a configuration management tool, and the configuration management tool told us, hey, we have two servers out there, and they have Oracle on them each, and each of those servers has a single processor. That would be great. So that happens at the discovery level. We know that that would, and we're using just numbers to help you get a feel of what it might look like from a numbers perspective. Um, and we're using list price for Oracle. So that would be about 95K. Let's go to the next slide or advance it. Now, when we get to that inventory level, which some things do and some things don't do very well, we specialize in that, we can see that, hey, these two servers are actually VMs. They're sitting on a host. And guess what? With Oracle licensing, you have to license all the cores on the underlying host and not the VM. So that price tag jumps from 95K to 950K. Can we move forward, please? And when we finally look at the fact, when we get to that measurement layer, that this is, in fact, a cluster, and those two VMs could live on anywhere in the cluster, guess what? Oracle license requires that you license the entire cluster, right? Anywhere where that VM could exist, you have to license it for. So if Oracle were to come into your environment and say, hey, um, we discovered these VMs, and they're living on this cluster, you would have a risk that would go into the millions of dollars because you would have to license all 60 processors that are in that cluster. And that's why we go through this deep, detailed uh, process of discovery, inventory, and measurement so we can give you a complete view of the environment. Just one more thing before I pass it over. We were the first solution to be verified by Oracle, which means that any results that we obtain from scanning an environment, Oracle LMS accepts them as true. So just to summarize, what we do is that we simplify the complexities of getting accurate data required for licensing, and then we forward that upstream to the intelligent solution, which simplifies the complexities of licensing. I'll pass it back to you, Brett. Thank you, Donnie. And uh, I'm just going to wrap up by kind of building a slide that shows visually how uh, both, both Equate and Intelligent Solutions participate in understanding the uh, the licensing needs uh, within the data center. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the the, the piece that we're in, um, uh, dependent upon is information. We need the right information and enough of it. And so that's what Equate is providing. They're providing that deep information through the DIME methodology that uh, gives us not just you know that software was found and a few pieces of information every once in a while about uh, you know how many processors, how many cores, but that other important information such as is it in a cluster, what role is it playing in the cluster, is it virtualized, who's the physical host, what are the parameters of the physical host, all that is necessary so that you can properly apply the license rules and come out with the, you know, the exact right licensing, not too many licenses, not too few licenses, so you know where you stand accurately. And So that's the first piece. Now with that piece, feed that up and we do all that analysis work, so that tells you what's out there and how it's been deployed, and we'll tell you how many licenses you need based on the licensing guides and the information that's presented through our complex license analyzer. We automate that piece. And so that's saving you know, yet hundreds of hours possibly depending on the licenses you're trying to understand and how many of them you have deployed. So that analyze and assess is dependent on that information. That's what iQuake gives us. Once you have that, now you can start to take action because now you know where you really stand. Some licenses you got sitting idle, put those into play. Some uh, licenses you need uh, more of, you've got a gap. You can decide what you want to do there. And some, you might say, well, we've deployed this in kind of a screwy way, and if we kind of rethink how we want to deploy this particular title and go with different additions, we might save ourselves quite a bit of money on the licensing now that we can see 
you know the, the the way we the way we've got it deployed and how licensing is is um, impacted by that. So this so these two pieces bring you the the visibility that you need to actually take the action you need to take to wind up with a data center that's optimized in terms of the licensing. You know, you're both compliant and you have made the most use out of the licensing uh, that it affords you. So that's in summary how all this uh, works. We've together we you know bring a fairly strong amount of automation to this problem, and um, uh, you know both our pieces are are essential to to uh, you know, to helping to solve the problem. At this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Matt. Matt, you can uh, check to see if we got any questions that came in, and uh, time whatever time we've got left, we'll go ahead and answer those questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brett and Donnie. Um, a number of questions have been posted, and uh, we just have a few moments to uh, fit in some. Um, a question regarding the iQuate inventory and discovery uh, solution. Donnie said that the iQuate solution is agentless, non-invasive, and low impact. Uh, what infrastructure is needed to implement this environment? Yeah, Matt, thank you for that question. Uh, so the question is what infrastructure is required to implement it? We can install IQ sonar on a single VM, uh, and in most cases, a single VM will be able to scan a very large, complex environment. If we need to scale it, we can simply add additional IQ sonar scanning VMs. Uh, and then to gather additional functionality, we can, uh, in, some t in some instances, we may uh, install a second VM which is going to allow us to put everything in a data warehouse. So okay. typically it's one, in some cases it's two. All right. Um, uh, got another one here for you. Uh, in the context of a complex and large data center environment, how quickly would the iQuay inventory and discovery solution be expected to be fully up and running? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so typically we can install a solution in under a day, uh, and in time to scan in very, very complex, global, large environments, we can scan that environment and well underneath a, a few weeks, typically two to three weeks. Um, something that's relatively mid-sized or small, we can actually do the actual scanning in a week. challenge for us is being able to go through the politics of getting credentials from the different server teams. But once we have that information, our scanning solution is very fast. And in many cases, customers come to us because they're at their 11th hour, they're going to have an audit done by one of the large vendors, and they have to get this information quickly and accurately, and that's where we really shine. Okay. Um, looks like I got one here for Brett. Um, you mentioned uh, something that there is a, there were license rules already established for the license analyzer. Uh, what did these cover? Yeah, okay, so uh, we have designed some rules uh, that clients are, have access, access to. Uh, all of the rules uh, for SQL Server, uh, starting with 2005, all editions, all versions, um, are up through 2012, all editions, all versions. So that's SQL Server. Anything that's IBM PVU based um, and also Oracle by processor. So th those are the main rules. We've also got a few other rules that we put in play, Creative Suite for Adobe. Um, we work with customers who you know, use the app application of the, um, the complex license analyzer also to handle suite licensing. Uh, to make sure that the you're not getting double counted for some of the suite elements, um, so that's that's where we we are currently. Uh, rules are being added, you know, as as we see more demand for them. But at the same time, it was originally designed to be a, a design tool for you know, the end customer, the consumer, to design their own rules based on the specifics of their contract, their license, and um, and the licensing guides that are applicable uh, under you know as governed by those contracts. Okay, um, thanks for that. Uh, one question that's kind of similar to that, uh, how easy is it to write rules for the license analyzer and what skills are required? Yeah, so as far as modeling the rule on our interface, we made that about as easy as we could figure out how to do that. That's, that's a Visio type interface. If you're, if you're uh, used to Visio, you'll find it very uh, comfortable. I mean, you just drag the rule steps onto the design platform and you wire them together. Uh, probably the the more time required would be understanding the rule you're trying to model. You know the research that you have to do to understand the rule you're trying to model. Some of the rules, like suite rules, are pretty straightforward. You know, the, using they can be modeled up in about a few minutes, really. Uh, the more complicated rules, like IBM PVU, that's you know, at least it took us probably uh, uh, weeks, if not 
uh, longer just to do the research and, and refine the rule, refine the rule, refine the rule until you know we felt that it handled all cases uh, that that could be foreseen or, or you know, that you might come across uh, with PVU. So it kind of gives you a range. One of the benefits that uh, and some of the interest we're seeing is is people that do SAM for a living, basically. Uh, especially if you have a fairly sizable practice, uniformity of applying the licensing rules um, uh, across various multiple uh, specialists, uh, a rules type engine like this is is very helpful, uh, and not not to mention the time it res it uh, cuts off of actually applying the rules, especially over multiple instances. But you know, just uniformity of making sure because I can tell you these rules are so complicated that you know you get one of them in your head and two days go by and you'll forget half of the uh, half of the you know the, the idiosyncrasies of the rule, so you get them captured and and uh, documented and put in play in a rules engine like this. Then at least every little idiosyncrasy and every little caveat and benefit that you can pull out of that that rule definition, uh, you know, can be now captured and, and held and applied uniformly time and time again. So that's that's another benefit of using a rules engine for this. Okay. Thanks, Brett, for that. Um... I think that's all the time we have for uh, questions today. Um, any remaining questions will be answered by email to your registration email address for this webinar. You can also send questions direct to advice at intelligentsolutions.com and the people at Intelligent and iQuake will get right back with you. Uh, that concludes this webinar session and thank you everyone for your time, especially Brett and Donnie. I appreciate your input there and, and help with the webinar. Um, that concludes this, uh, this recording of this webinar will be posted on the intelligentsolutions.com website under the resources tab uh, where you will also find more webinar recordings and white papers available to you. Um, thank you everyone.